Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, so um, in this talk, I'd like to review two algorithms that we have recently proposed based on this framework of uh, random functions or random features. So the mindset here is that you have millions of points, millions of features, and the processing capacity of your smartphone. And um, this is joint work with Philip Hennig, Bernard Sholkov, and Surbit Tsra from the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems, Alex Smola from CMU, and Sumin Karamani here in Cambridge. Okay, so let me begin with some uh, very classical problem that we all faced at some point, and it's the case of nonlinear binary classification, right? So in this problem, you're given a bunch of blue points, a, blank, a bunch of red points, and your professional uh, career will be summarized to find an algorithms that will perfectly separate these two clouds. And um, a somewhat useful way to proceed in this setup is to map your raw features or explode them into a very high dimensional space on which we hope to find a linear separation boundary, okay? So in this case, we are creating a third dimension that will go, uh, that will elevate each of the points to an altitude proportional to the, of their distance to the origin, all right? And uh, doing this, um, one way of doing this is to use what we call a kernel function, uh, which is a function that will tell us how uh, close together two points are in some feature space that we don't necessarily need to know, all right? So in this case, um, this feature space uh, worked pretty well for a problem. We can separate the two clouds of points with a, with a hyperplane, and uh, the induced decision boundary in the original space would be this, this circle, okay? But um, the problem today with millions or tens of millions of points is that you have to deal with these objects. So the so-called kernel trick can be the kernel trap, right? You have to build these kernel matrices, which will be for a million points, a million times a billion, this is um, an operation uh, squared in the number of points you have, and in many scenarios you even have to invert uh, these monsters, right? So that's even cubic. And all this effort is to capture exactly the essence of the kernel, which is the square exponential, and then we build this full rank matrix to perfectly capture the feature space associated with this kernel. And my message here is that you can do much better by just um, building a randomized and approximate but explicit feature space that will capture the essence of the kernel, not exactly, but in a much nicer way. And uh, one a smart trick to do so is to use a classical um, result from Fourier analysis uh, called Bochner's theorem. Um, this is pretty old result, but it was not until 2008 when Ali Rahimi and Benjamin Reck decided to use this in the context of kernels. And the theorem goes as follows, bear with me, it's a little bit of math, but any shift invariant kernel, which means that I can express my kernel with only one argument, which is the distance between the points I'm evaluating. And by the way, I think uh, in the talk from Zubin and James, I think most of the kernels are shift invariant, so you could use these tricks to scale uh, the automatic statistician to millions of points. Uh, any kernel of that form can be expressed by its Fourier transform, which turns out to be, if the kernel is positive definite, a, po a non-negative measure. All right, so ignoring normalization constants, we can sample from that measure. So let's express the kernel as the Fourier transform, and then instead of computing this integral, which will take us to the exact reproducing kernel Hilbert space, but all this kernel matrix business, let's express it as a finite term sum of t terms, okay? And now this is not equal, it's approximately equal with an error term of one over square root of t, just uh, approximating an integral with Monte Carlo. The cool thing about this representation is that I can separate the things that depend on x from the things that depend on y, concatenate them in a vector, and then I will have a randomized but explicit feature space. And now I'm going to step back, and instead of using dual algorithms, I will use linear but primal algorithms on this set x representation. And this will allow me to do, for example, nonlinear regression in linear time complexity with respect to the sample size. All right, so. There's two applications of this idea that we've worked in the past two years, and the first of them is to develop a nonlinear dependence of measures, a nonlinear measure of dependence. And we call it the randomized dependence coefficient. And the task at hand here is, well, you're given a sample that can be the circular pattern plus noise, and you're interested in characterizing if there exists a dependence between X and Y or not. So in the case of using a linear measure of dependence, like correlation, you will get something close to zero, because there's no linear direction in this sample that we 
explain the variation in the data, but we want to, to have something more general, and we will use these random features to do so. So the method works as follows. The first step here is kind of a preprocessing step on which we will make all the marginal distributions, all the features in X, all the features in Y look uniformly distributed, and this is called the copula transformation of our data. This will make our dependency statistic invariant with respect to monotonic transformations in our data. Uh, Miguel, in the afternoon session, will talk more about this. This is a logarithmic time um, uh, transformation, so we don't lose much time, much time doing that. The second step will be the random feature step. So in, in methods like KCCA or HSEC um, or some other state-of-the-art dependence measures, you will build the kernel matrix and then do some spectral analysis on it. Instead, we are going to build this approximate but explicit feature space. We're going to do it for X. We're going to do it for Y separately. And now, instead of a scalar random variables, we're going to have K projections of X, K projections of Y. And then our dependence statistic will be the linear combination of X and simultaneously the linear combination of Y, such that we reveal as much correlation as possible. So in summary, we're given some raw data, and we have computed these transformations here, such that we push X through these transformations, we push Y through this one, and then we get something that uh, gets the correlation revealed. And that's our dependency statistic. Okay. It turns out that we're approximating a very classical dependence measure, uh, but this is uh, uncomputable in general. It's searching over some Banach spaces, some uh, two general functions f and g. You cannot plug this in into a computer without further regularization. And we have um, reduced this problem to a linear thing, which is uh, the CCA step. So if you want to know more about this, uh, there's, uh, this has been published in last NIPS. Uh, the first new thing about using these this random features is that you can really do a, theoretic, a clean theoretical analysis. Everything becomes a random variable, everything becomes independent, so uh, making claims about the algorithms is, is pretty straightforward. We've been uh, able to show that this RDC, a statistic of hours, converges to, to what we have presented before. Well, when, uh, when, there's, um, when this HDR statistic is restricted to some functional class, more details uh, of line. And then the convergence rate is 1 over square root of n, like any statistical method, plus an additive term, which is 1 over square root of k, where k is the number of random projections. And then you can understand k here as a trade-off between a speed and accuracy, depending on the setup you're working in. Then uh, the computational complexity is rather uh, roughly um, n log n in the, in the sample size, although you can improve on that. And then you can uh, also uh, identify some limiting behaviors of, of, the, of the statistic with respect to its hyperparameters. The second neat thing about the random features is that they allow you to code your, your algorithms in a bunch of lines. So this is the R source code for, for everything I've just described. It's just five lines. And it's pretty fast. Uh, for a million data points, for example, we, we run in, in four seconds. And Previous state of the art, like KCCA, will take 43 seconds to run 100,000 100, samples, and we take 100 times less. And you might be worried that the accuracy has been dropped, but this is indeed not the case. Um, here, we are depicting how well the dependency statistic is capturing each of these patterns depicted in little boxes here. And in the x-axis, we are adding uh, additive noise to these patterns. So by the end that we uh, are placed in, in this region, it's just a cloud of points. So really none of the methods can identify the underlying dependence. Uh, we also did some feature selection experiments. Uh, this is Gaussian process regression. When we select um, two, four, six, etc., cetera, features uh, greedily by maximizing the dependence between the features we select and the output that we are trying to regress to. And also the, the performance here is surprisingly good. Uh, and that's the first part of the talk. I don't know if there's any questions about that. No? OK. Um, the second application of the random features that we have done is to component analysis methods. Things like PCA, CCA. We have, we have taken the kernel version of these algorithms, applied the random feature trick to them, and see how well they scaled and analyze some theoretical properties of them. So in the case of KCCA, the solutions of kernel, uh, KPCA, sorry, the solutions are uh, defined by the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of the kernel matrix K. And in our case, we are going to approximate this matrix by K hat, where K hat is now not going to be full rank. It's going to be the sum or of M random features of this form. 
and uh, each of them will be uh, dot product against itself and, and form a rank one matrix. Okay. And uh, the, the basic result that we've been uh, able to prove is that you again achieve some kind of inverse square root uh, convergence rate with respect to the uh, original method. And, and this result uh, is in operator norm, so it's, it's very expressive in, in terms of uh, all, it's controlling all the marginals. And this will be considered like a major result uh, some years ago, but thanks to the um, uh, recently developed matrix concentration inequalities by Lester McKay, and colleagues, this was uh, a joy to prove because all the features are independent, you have a sum of independent matrices, concentration of measure happens very, very nicely. The same thing for canonical correlation analysis, although this was slightly more tricky to prove because there's some inverses floating around, so we, are, we have only results for the regularized version of canonical correlation analysis. Again, uh, the bound is of the same characteristics as PCA, plus this multiplicative term, which has an inverse linear effect with respect to the regularizer. So we cannot make any claim for unregularized CCA, and this is something that I would be uh, very interested in discussing. Again, uh, coding these methods, you can do it in a slide, which is something pretty weird. By, by the way, who uses R in the audience? Oh, okay, that's surprising. Um, yeah, the code here is for CCA and, and PCA. And in terms of accuracy, we have done some experiments with CCA. In CCA, um, in, in a sentence, takes two views of the same data and finds a linear, uh, a linear subspace of these two views that is maximally correlated. In the case of kernel CCA, we are not talking about correlation, we are talking about dependence, so it's much more expressive. This D, uh, DCCA stands for Deep Canonical Correlation Analysis. Essentially, you take the two views of your data you push them through a deep neural network and, um, well, and you develop a back propagation rule that maximizes the correlation of the outputs of the network. Uh, this guy here uh, is coded in C with some parallel libraries and took like 12 hours to, to run on this data set, 100,000 points or something like that. And then the proposed method in the previous slide, which is RCCA and achieves with enough random projections the same accuracy, took like two minutes in my laptop. So the, the, the computational savings are, are quite huge. This data set, if you're interested, is uh, two views consistent. The first one is the speech, and the second one is the tongue placement of the speaker. So you want to find um, correlated representations of these two uh, views. And this is the, the amount of extracted correlation in some test set. Another application of this method that we have tried is this learning using privileged information. Again, you have access to two views of some data but one of them is gonna be missing at test time. So in this case, we have pictures of animals, and for each of the pictures, we have some summary like this. Is the animal black, is the animal white, and so on. But in test time, we assume that these binary attributes will be missing, and we will only have the, um, the pictures to, to train our classifier with. But still, we want to extract some information between these two views, because these high-level attributes for example, when you train with them, you will achieve 100% accuracy. And when, we, when you train only with the images, you will get 55 or so. So we use the CCA method again. Um, and using surf features for the images achieves something like 55% accuracy. And using this common subspace uh, of uh, nonlinear uh, random features um, uh, improves the, um, the classification accuracy by 5 to 10%. I think that's pretty much it, and um, the takeaway message here is that randomness provides easy theoretical analysis, implicit regularization, and we have seen this in random forest and, and dropout neural networks, for example, a scalability, and, and little loss in performance in many scenarios. And also some research directions. We have pointers on how to tackle these problems, but I'm very interested in, in discussing with you is can we use these random functions uh, to perform density estimation, which is a much more challenging problem? Uh, can we come up with better design issues for sampling the random features? If we want to approximate the, the Gaussian kernel, we sample from a Gaussian, right? But if there's something more complicated, can, can we come up with, with some other designs? Does it help to build deep randomized architectures on how to do so? Uh, can we incorporate the sparsity assumptions in the random projections in some way? 
Or for example, can we build incremental methods uh, for model selection? I build a um, regressor with a thousand features, but then maybe it's not good enough. If I want to build a regressor with a, a thousand and a hundred, do I have to rebuild the whole thing again, or can I append the features somehow? And, and that's about it, thanks.